So the next discovery, uh, also published in the New England Journal, uh, led to Olaparib in BRCA patients. Uh, and, and again, we have uh, Katie Moore here, who was the first author of that published in the New England Journal, approved uh, in December uh, of 2018. Tell us, Katie, more about, about that study and, and what that has meant to our practice in the frontline setting. Yeah, thanks. As you know, I love to talk about Solo One. <laughs> so that's Solo One. Uh, it was a, a randomized phase three study and enrolled women only with uh, BRCA associated cancers and predominantly germline mutations in BRCA. They had have advanced cancer, have had an attempt at a cytoreductive surgery, and at the end of platinum-based chemo, be in a complete or partial response to chemotherapy, at which point they were randomized uh, two to one to receive a laparib uh, tablets versus placebo until progression or toxicity or the two-year mark. And the primary endpoint was investigator-assessed progression-free survival. Uh, that took a long time to reach, but finally uh, resulted and demonstrated a hazard ratio of 0.3 which translated to a difference in the median uh, progression-free survival counted from the end of chemotherapy, importantly, uh, of 13.8 months in the control arm and not reached in the uh, arm that was treated with Olaparib, but was somewhere around 47 to 49 months. Uh, and then PFS2 was positive as well. And there've been several subsequent exploratory analyses and all the different uh, surgical and residual disease subgroups uh, demonstrating uh, really equal magnitude of benefit, regardless of how you slice it. And that led appropriately to a change in the standard of care for these women. Now, now when you say standard of care, I, I look at that as defined as what reasonable physicians would do in a similar setting. It doesn't really mean it's the only standard of care. Uh, Tom Krivak, is this the only standard of care if you have a BRCA mutation is to get a PARP inhibitor? I... Uh... I hate using the term standard of care, but I know that we use it a lot. So uh, how the question is phrased, I would say, um, I, I think that you, you have to have a reason not to give it. I, I <laughs> think data that has been presented in, in the great trial that, that, that Katie ran. And um, to me, I think when you look at that data, it's just so impressive that I, I completely agree. And, you know, I think sometimes there's been a slow adoption, but to, to not be on it with a germline mutation as well as somatic mutation um, I, I just, I, I, I kind of get nervous. And I think if you actually would show patients some of these Kaplan-Meier curves, when they say, I don't think I really need it. And you say, do you want to be on the top line or bottom line? There's such separation that I think most patients would say, I don't understand why you aren't making me take this. Um, right. So, you know, I think standard care is, is, I hate that term, but I know that we use it, but I would say that it, you really have to have a strong reason not to, to be using a PARP inhibitor and a BRCA mutated and the patient has a BRCA mutation at this time. So Katie, I know you like to talk about it and we like to listen to you. So that's a great <laughs> opportunity. You, you've presented this all around the world and, and we love it. Do, do you ever present it and people say, well, you know, I'm not sure. Never, right? Oh no, I get that. Uh, yeah. Why, why, why I, do people say that? Why? Tell us, uh, that's what I'm trying to, 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 to discuss here. Yeah. Save it for later crowd. <laughs> yeah, the save it for later crowd. So, and, uh, yeah. and I had the opportunity to debate someone who's really a believer in that at the NRG this year. And I think that there's, um, there's just no rationale for that. So I, I've stopped being nice about it because I just really <laughs> don't want to, I don't want it to even be considered an equivalent <laughs> option. You know, we should have learned that uh, message from the Bevacizumab story, which you just demonstrated. You, you can't look at something like, so the argument is you look at solo one and solo two and the hazard ratios are bo both 0.3. And so someone says, well, I can use it here or now or later and I get the same benefit, which A, assumes your patient, you're going to let your patient recur. And I don't know why you would let your patient recur, number one. And number two, those are two completely different treatment li lines of therapy. And so if you look at the Bevacizumab, if you did the same thing with bevacizumab, but lined up front line, um, second line, um, like Oceans or 213, and then Aurelia, and use that rationale, then you would say, well, I would only use it in Aurelia setting, which is, which is asinine. Like, why would you wait in your highest risk po population? It is a good drug there, but, but your front line's where you have the opportunity to cure somebody. So it makes no sense. The argument makes no sense. Um, it kind of makes my head explode. <laughs> so, so but before we before we offend too many people, I'm going to stop you there. But that's that's great. And um, 
but thank you. Thank you for your hard work on that. Uh, I look at it as, a, as an unprecedented result. Uh, I think, uh, you know, standard of care, whatever the definition is, I think we have an obligation to discuss that with our patients. And the obligation begins with germline and somatic testing, because if you don't test, you don't have the opportunity.